Welcome to the Human Rights Session of International Forum One Korea. I'm Kenji Sawai, Northeast Asia Director at Office of Strategic Partnership, the Global Peace Foundation. The title of this forum is Free and Unified Korea, a catalyst for regional and global peace and development. To realize a unified Korea, first freedom and human rights must be guaranteed. Today, the international community faces critical challenges of oppressive critical system, including concentrated camps and critical human rights abuses in DPRK, North Korea. The complete COVID blockage of the DPRK border, um, malnutrition and corruption, even after the COI report of the uh, United Nations reveals the uh, cruel realities. Human dignity and innate value, the God-given human rights, must be preserved in all members of the human family. The re uh, resolution of human rights crisis in Korea can finally be achieved through a unified free unified Korea. In this occasion, uh, specialists seek to advance international cooperation for human rights and freedom, peaceful international humanitarian intervention, religious freedom, legal actions, solving the divided Korean family issues, and approaches for transforming the system in North Korea. So before I go to uh, speakers, uh, first Q and the session uh, after this speeches. So please uh, using the bottom, bottom uh, please write Q and A. So we welcome uh, in Korean language, English, even Japanese, okay? So please write down, we will uh, reply later. So also uh, detailed bio, uh, there's detailed bio on Gropis Foundation web. So please watch it. I uh, explain uh, short. So please watch it for uh, saving time. Next, uh, now uh, we are happy welcome the former chairman of the Hana Foundation, Mr. Kwan Ju Song. Uh, Mr. Kanjuson dedicated 20 years uh, to the North Korean human rights movement. He co-founded the famous uh, Daily NK, the first internet news site about North Korea. He will speak in Korean today, Korean language. So if you uh, um, yeah, want to listen to English, please select uh, the uh, inter uh, presentation. Please click the grow mark logo, then select the English. Okay. So, the welcome, Mr. Kwan Ji Song. You are the floor. Yeah, 안녕하십니까. 저는 손광주입니다. Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. As introduced, my name is Son Kwangju. I'm really pleased to be here at the 2022 International Forum on One Korea. I've been researching North Korea and campaigning for human rights in North Korea for more than 20 years since the late 1990s. In 2004, we launched Daily NK, the world's first internet online newspaper dedicated to North Korean issues. Daily NK began to convey what was happening inside North Korea to the outside world via news articles, photos, and videos, while informing the world of the measurable state of human rights in North Korea. Because of this, the Chinese Public Security Bureau arrested and imprisoned North Korean human rights activists who were hiding like an underground resistance near the China-North Korea border to report for Daily NK. Today, 
I would like to briefly share my opinion on the hereditary autocracy and human rights in North Korea with you. Hwang jang yeok the former Secretary of International Affairs for the Workers' Party of Korea, defected to South Korea in 1997. And with his paper, The Reality of Human Rights in North Korea, he was the first to expose the state of human rights in North Korea. I still remember vividly the first sentence of that paper. The first sen sentence was, North Korea is a society without human rights. The country is one giant prison. This exemplifies how North Korean society is a backward society without human rights and is not part of modern society. In 2013, chaired by the former justice of the High Court of Australia, Michael Kirby, The Commission of Inquiry, or COI, on human rights in the Democratic People's Republic of Korea was established by the UN to investigate the state of human rights in North Korea in earnest. At the time, the two members of the COI visited South Korea and they asked me, what do you think is the fundamental cause of the human rights issue in North Korea? And I responded by quoting the first sentence of Hwang jang yeops paper. I explained to the commissioners that the human rights issue stems from the system of North Korea itself. My reply was faithfully reflected in the commission's report published the following year. Today, many people think of the North Korean regime as just an extreme autocracy, but that is not the case. In the late 1960s, The structure of the hereditary autocratic leadership of North Korea began to take shape and was virtually perfect, both in theory and practice. After Kim Jong-il succeeded Kim Il-sung in 1972, over the next 10 years, culminating in the 1980s, a never-before-seen level of autocratic system was completed. North Korea's autocratic system features the Juche ideology and the rules of the Workers' Party with various autocratic organizations to surveil and control the people. However, the most fundamental aspect of the hereditary autocracy leadership structure is the 10 principles for the establishment of a monolithic ideological system. Commonly referred to as the 10 principles, It consists of three immuno, immutable elements. They are the deification, absolutization, and unconditionality of the leader Kim Il-sung. The principles deified Kim Il-sung, making him infallible and granting him a divine nature beyond a mere human being. The 10 principles transcend the rules of the Workers' Party of Korea or the Socialist Constitution of the DPRK, having an all-party extra-constitutional status, meaning every party member and every North Korean citizen has to recite and live by the principles from the day they are born until the day they die. As the 10 principles are made up of 10 articles and seven directives, they are too long to share with you today in its entirety, but I will briefly introduce a few of them. Even in a short life, live only for the great leader, devote your our youth and life for him, and keep loyal minds toward the great leader. Unconditionally accept, treat as a non-negotiable condition, and decide everything based upon our great leader Kim Il-sung's instructions. Consider political life as the first life, never bend one's political beliefs and revolutionary integrity. Learn to throw away like bits of straw one's physical life for political life. We must establish strong organizational regulations so that the entire party nation, and military move as one under the one and only leadership of the great leader, Kim Il-sung. The other 10 principles and their directives go on in this fashion, with the 10th principle finishing with, we must pass down the great achievement of the revolution by great leader comrade Kim Il-sung from generation to generation, 
inheriting and completing it to the end. It is a codification of the hereditary autocracy leadership. And these 10 principles have completely regulated the way North Koreans think and behave in line with principle three, directive six, protecting the portrait of Kim Il-sung and holding it to your chest when escaping from a house fire is an unconscious act that North Koreans would take. Regulations like the 10 principles were not present in Stalin's leadership theory for Soviet Russia, nor for China in the Cultural Revolution era. The 10 principles are the worst and most autocratic principles in history. Currently, of the estimated 100,000 to 150,000 North Koreans who are in political prison camps, 70 to 80 percent of them are there for violating the principles. These 10 principles are a modern slavery document that urgently needs to be abolished. And the leaders of North Korea have always thoroughly concealed these principles. This is because they knew that if the 10 principles, which maximized the idolatry of the leader and eliminated basic human rights, like the right to life and freedom, were exposed to the rest of the world, North Korea's reputation would be badly affected, even in then communist Soviet Union, China, and East European countries. Without knowing the 10 principles, it is difficult to understand North Korean society and the mental structure of the North Korean people. The 10 principles take the 10 commandments of Christianity and apply them to the cult of the North Korean leader. If the Christian 10 commandments are the 10 commandments of light, the North Korean 10 principles are the 10 commandments of darkness. If the Christian 10 commandments are the 10 commandments of good, the North Korean 10 principles are the 10 commandments of evil. This is the reason why the North Korean regime secretly fears and suppresses Christianity more than any other religion. If Christianity were to take root in North Korea, the 10 principles would disappear. If the 10 principles disappear, the hereditary autocratic leadership would be left without a leg to stand on and would soon collapse. Currently, the core concern of the North Korean regime is to continue the succession of the autocratic leadership, no matter the cost. This is the sole task given to the Workers' Party, the state, and the military. The essence of all North Korean domestic and foreign policies is the preservation of the hereditary autocratic leadership. Anything else is of secondary importance. The purpose of the North Korean nuclear weapons program is also to preserve this leadership. Only by knowing these facts can we truly understand and solve the North Korean problem. There are currently two main problems with North Korea, the nuclear weapons problem and the human rights problem. Of course, solving the nuclear issue is important. However, in the process of preparing and promoting liberal democratic reunification, the issue of most importance is human rights in North Korea. Recently, a young North Korean defector said the following in a video on their YouTube channel. Quote, what North Koreans desperately want right now is choco pie, not choco pie, but Wi-Fi, unquote. Essentially, North Koreans are desperate for some form of connection with the outside world they are cut off from. What they want is communication with the outside world and connecting via human cooperative relations. All the diplomats who are stationed in Pyongyang have now left. Due to the state surveillance and COVID-19, the North Korean people are alive but not living. Without a change in the North Korean regime, resolving the nuclear issue or the issue of reforming and opening up North Korea will be difficult. The ones wanting change the most are not us, but the 24 million North Korean citizens themselves. We need to listen to their silent outcry. Only then can we bring about change in North Korea. Ultimately, those who will execute the change in North Korea are the citizens themselves. 
they are the agents of history. Having outside information enter North Korea, having the realities of North Korea's situation shared truthfully with the outside world, and information being shared freely between North Korean citizens. These are three main tasks for human rights in North Korea at this point in time. When the South Korean government and civic organizations, the UN and international society consistently pursue these tasks together in solidarity, then we will be able to find important clues on how to bring about change in North Korea. The reality we are faced with is certainly not easy. However, this path is the most certain and fastest in terms of solving all North Korean issues and achieving the unification of the Korean Peninsula. Thank you for listening. Thank you for your lifetime dedication to North Korean human rights. Thank you very much. Uh, we understood the North Korea's 10 principle must change to 10 commandments. We must work together and send outside information uh, into North Korea for the uh, people in North Korea. Thank you very much. The next, uh, so our next speaker is uh, Dr. Uh, Jin Shin. Uh, he is the president of Institute for Peace Affairs, at Tunam National University. Dr. Shin has spent more than 20 years researching Korean unification. He also worked for religious freedom in North Korea, in Korea and the, and the world. So uh, welcome, Dr. Jin Shin. Okay. 감사합니다. 음, 솔로니 교수님, 박사님, 어, 많은 말씀 들어서. Thank you for your introduction. And I also enjoyed the uh, presentation by the first speaker. So I would like to uh, give an address very briefly. And as explained by the first speaker, I believe uh, North Korea is the most exclusive society in the world. And also the Chuche ideology or Chuche thought is run like a religion in North Korea and Christianity and other religions have almost be annihilated. And Pongchu, a Pongsu church and Changchungdang Catholic church were established in 1988. And in Pyongyang, some devotees or followers begin their religious activities under cover to promote their unification strategy. And in 2020, about 6 million mobile phones are in use in North Korea, especially used, they are used by those who participate in Changmadang, the market. And also young people in their 20s and 30s from wealthy families in Pyongyang tend to use them more and more. And this young generation live more affluently compared to those in the past. Also, they can easily access the external information. So they have more opportunities to access foreign and Korean dramas and movies and K-pop. So even though the information has been controlled by the North Korean authorities, we can say that the control over information has been quite relaxed, which is raising our expectations. In addition, Juche ideology is now used by North Korean authorities to justify its rule over its people. So this ideology is justifying North Korea's authorities' rule and governance over North Korean people, and some people consider Juche ideology as just some form of religion. And as Dr. Son explained, people consider, people even deify Kim Il-sung in North Korea. And there are 10 principles of North Korea, which are used just like 10 commandments of Christianity. And what's interesting in North Korea, by the way, is the exposure to capitalism by those in their uh, by teenagers in North Korea, then what 
the international community needs to do for the Korean Peninsula. So there are changes observed in North Korea. So we need to think about what kind of information we can uh, expose the North Korean residents to. In addition, when you think about the unification on the Korean Peninsula, we need to think of it as something that will be a landmark in terms of broad human history. When the French Revolution began, there, uh, it led to the birth of the modern philosophies like freedom and others. So just like the French Revolution, I believe the unification of North and South Korea will, will result in new uh, values that can lead the future uh, generation. And in that sense, I believe the spirit of Hongik Ingan can be an important concept in building a utopian society based on AI. So for the time's sake, I would like to uh, share my conclusion first. And as Dr. Son pointed out, I believe the agent of change in North Korea would be North Korean residents. Now, after the collapse of Soviet Union, we have Russia and the ultimate change of Soviet Union came from the residents of Soviet Union. And the same goes to the case of Germany because the East Germans voted to be integrated into the West Germany and that led to the peaceful unification of the two Germanys. I believe when we uh, work for the unification of the Korean Peninsula, that depends on the attitudes of the North Korean residents. So there are teenagers and those in their 20s in North Korean residents in North Korea and what kind of ideology we will provide to those residents and how we can provide external information to them. It's the question we need to grapple with. And so we need to be prepared for that and we need to pr provide such information to those in their 10s and 20s in North Korea. And what kind of vision we need to have for unification of the Korean Peninsula. I believe the unification of the Korean Peninsula is not just a matter of the two Koreas because it will have significance in terms of broader human history because unification of the two Koreas will serve as a model for integration for countries overseas to overcome their conflicts between the same nation, within the same nation and to overcome their civil wars. So a lot of countries worldwide are suffering from conflict. However, the unifi unified Korea can be a model for them to overcome such conflict. Next, the unification of Korea will set an example of the victory of freedom and democracy over the last remnant of communism. And third, the unified Korea will mean a victory of universal rationality of humanity over human rights repression and authoritarian regimes. Also, this will serve as a good model for countries that experienced colonization just like South Korea. South Korea also was colonized in the past. However, the unified Korea will serve as a good model for successful economic development of the countries that were once colonized. In addition, the unified Korea can demonstrate to the world that the integration between an advanced country and the least developed country can be made possible. In that sense, I believe the unified Korea can present a new a philosophy for the future. Thank you for listening. The pre-market generation in North Korea, the Chanmadan generation, uh, to change the system uh, from uh, inside in North Korea. 
So for the uh, development of North Korea, freedom is our biggest uh, priority. So uh, leaders, freedom is the core of the human rights. So let's work together. Also like a Christian in North Korea, a lot of uh, uh, so persecution is uh, worst in the world. So we need to pay attention to that one too. So let's work together. So the next, so we uh, were very honored to introduce uh, Ambassador uh, Mostan. Uh, he is a dean of School of Law at Liberty University, and served as the first Asian American ambassador at large for global criminal justice in U.S. history. He has published more law review articles on North Korea than anyone. He is also he's a Korean American. So, uh, Ambassador Mostan, we welcome you. I'm glad to join everyone today. And I've been asked to speak about the very important issue of North Korean human rights. This is a critical subject for anyone who cares about human rights, anyone who cares about the Korean Peninsula, anyone who is a human being with uh, even uh, a small sense of decency and conscience uh, should care intensely and deeply about what is the worst human rights situation, bar none, in the world. And that is the human rights situation in North Korea. I do not say that easily or lightly. Uh, having taught many years in this space and also having served as the US ambassador at large for global criminal justice, I'm aware of many grave and horrific human rights situations, situations of mass atrocities uh, worldwide. And among them, uh, the situation presently in North Korea, and as it has been over decades, has been the worst, bar none, uh, in the world. And I have asked people to, if they want to challenge that, to try to challenge that. But I, as far as I'm aware, I'm not uh, aware of anyone who has successfully been able to demonstrate to me that uh, any situation is worse. And that's saying a lot because there are some really grave and serious situations all over the world. But when you consider in a country of 24 million people that the government uh, as it is called, as it has styled itself, has murdered some 15 million of its own people. And if you take that as a percentage, or if you take that as a, as a number, uh, just in terms of the sheer amount, you know, let's think about the comparisons here. We're talking about, you know, 1.6 million that died at the hands of the Khmer Rouge in Cambodia. We're talking about 800,000 to 1.2 million, so the estimates go, with respect to the Rwandan genocide. We're talking about maybe 6 million for the Holocaust of uh, World War II. And when you're talking about 15 million in North Korea and a, for a country with the population of 24 million, this is a staggering percentage, a staggering number, and one that should give many people pause who do not realize how serious it is and what has been happening in North Korea. People talk about concentration camps as if that was something just a thing of the past. No, it is not because there are these active concentration camps in North Korea that are like those of the Stalinist gulags in the Soviet Union or the Maoist uh, camps in China or the concentration camps, the Nazi concentration camps in World War II, but they are all those sorts of things and more and worse. And you might ask, how could I say worse? One of the things that was not a feature of those other concentration camps, in North Korea, you have three generations that are punished. And so, it was made North Korea doctrine by Kim Il-sung that 
three, up to three generations of the seed of anti-revolutionaries need to be eliminated. And so somebody could be in a total control zone, concentration camp, born and live out their lives there for no other reason than a grandparent having run afoul of the Kim regime. And so this is a feature of uh, the North Korean regime that should shock the consciences of everyone in the world. Most people who are put in these concentration camps do not survive. They do not leave there alive. And the torture that happens as a regular matter of course inside of these concentration camps is truly, truly horrific. Um, I could give many examples um, and they are very, each example would be very painful, but maybe I could give one example along these lines. There was a North Korean, um, well, North Korea had done very well in one of the World Cup uh, competitions for soccer. And I believe they made it to like the quarterfinals or something along those lines. And one might think that the team would be honored uh, when upon their return. What actually happened is that the members of this team that did extraordinarily well were placed in concentration camps for excessive celebration. And one of the things that has been true of the North Korean regime for a long time, anytime those in North Korea get a view of anything outside of the jail of a country known as North Korea, the regime feels threatened because they know that the propaganda that they put forth, that this is the greatest place on planet Earth, that paradise is right around the corner, I mean, it's so patently false as to be absurd. If you even know of one other place on the planet besides North Korea, you would know that, in fact, for the people of North Korea, it is arguably the worst place to live on planet Earth. And there was a particular um, player on the North Korea soccer uh, team representing the country in the World Cup who had done very well, who was placed in this um, this small enclosed box-like apparatus where he could, there wasn't enough space to, or ways to sit down or to much less to lie down. And the person inside had to be in a sort of crouching position. And he was put in there for two weeks, just excruciating. When they took him out, he just collapsed because he was in such excruciating pain. And he was the only one to have survived being in there for two weeks, in part because his physical conditioning as a world-class athlete was so uh, tremendous that he actually survived for two weeks. But imagine what it's like if anyone has sat against a wall, did, did a wall sit, even doing that for uh, 20 minutes is a remarkable length of time. But to be in such a cramped situation uh, where you can't even sit properly, much less lie down, and you have to be in this crouching position for two weeks was truly excruciating torture. Um, and this is actually a form of torture that they have that is less unspeakable than some of the other forms of torture that North Korea inflicts day after day, week in, week out, to inmates who are punished for little or no reason uh, when they are inside of these concentration camps. North Korea tries to hide the fact that it has these camps. They hide them between mountains. They try to explain away um, satellite imagery by saying, oh, these are just farming villages and things along these lines. But there are, there is now uh, quite an accumulation of firsthand testimony of those who have survived from these concentration camps and have been brave enough to tell about their experiences. Uh, there is enough evidence along these lines 
such that this is something that cannot be so facilely denied and, uh, and made as if this was some sort of false concoction of enemies of the North Korean regime. That is actually um, patently untrue based on the rather sizable amount of evidence that, uh, that currently exists. But even if you're not in a concentration camp, as I referred to before, the whole country is like one jail of a country. Uh, the, the lack of rights that are respected by people is so serious, so egregious, I thought that it would be appropriate to coin a new term to describe it. That term is rightlessness because the people live in a state of rightlessness where none of their rights are being honored by their government. And so whether it's rights of associations, free speech, uh, exercise of religion, freedom of religion, uh, whether it is uh, rights of conscience, whether it, you know, you, you basically want to talk about, say, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights or the, um, or the, you know, the covenant on civil and political rights or the covenant on economic, social and uh, uh, cultural rights, or whether you want to talk about just rights that are accorded by governments all throughout the world as a matter of course, by virtue of being a human being. Um, these are systematically violated uh, in North Korea. And uh, it is, it, and thus, when I talk about it being one jail of a country, uh, that's what I mean. You can't move freely inside the country, uh, much less leave the country, which is considered a uh, high crime uh, there. The border guards are ordered to shoot to kill on site, even children who are seeking to escape uh, from the horrible injustices uh, inside of North Korea. It is so stifling. What you, what you can eat, what you can wear, uh, what sort of work you can do, um, your family situation, uh, you know, all these things are dictated by this most totalitarian of regimes in North Korea. And what you get is based on your perceived political loyalty of yourself and that of your family and including multiple generations. That determines what your allotment along these lines is, what sort of education you get, what sort of opportunities you have, so forth and so on are all uh, totalitarian, uh, are, are determined by totalitarian control. And uh, if you look at, for example, let's take one of those rights, uh, religious liberty, for example. There is more persecution, especially against Christians in North Korea, based on every study, every year, by every source, with no exception, as these things have been studied. Whether you're talking about the US State Department, whether you're talking about uh, public interest organizations, all these different places that track this sort of thing, the worst persecutor, bar none, uh, is the North Korean regime, where they have had policies to systematically martyr leaders and also many who are just sort of rank and file um, believers. Uh, and so this is, it's interesting, but somehow the particularly severe and the most severe persecution has been against Christians. That, by the way, is true worldwide. It is the most persecuted group, bar none in the world. We're talking as a group in the hundreds of millions who are severely persecuted, but no place where it's worse than in North Korea. Some might say, oh, well, they have an official Catholic church, an official Protestant church. No, these are sham um, sham, uh, pretend acting sorts of things to try to satisfy human rights inspectors and people who are coming to visit that are run by the Communist Party members uh, that run North Korea. Uh, and these are not actual uh, churches that are there. 
But that's true in general for North Korea because propaganda, lies, mendacity is just normal and pervasive in North Korea. In fact, it is rare for them to speak the truth. When they speak the truth, which is rare, it happens occasionally, it is for purposes that they have, um, but it is actually the exception and not the rule. It is, it is thought, such a society that is just woven in lies that when they say the truth on anything, it is actually stunning and exceptional uh, because it is generally rare. It is generally rare. Um, and the degree of propaganda that is just pervasive, um, there is a lot of anti-Japanese propaganda. There is a lot of anti-American propaganda. There's a lot of anti-South Korean propaganda. These are probably the three main strands of their uh, propaganda against groups. If I were to give an example, uh, uh, and this is North Korean arithmetic, that if you had a platoon of 35 American soldiers and you threw a grenade and you killed 12 of them, how many are left? This is an example of North Korean arithmetic. And uh, that's how pervasive uh, their propaganda is. And so people who have visited North Korea are given the propaganda tour. I'm so familiar with uh, these, uh, the contents of these propaganda tours. I could give a North Korea propaganda tour if I were so called upon uh, to do so. Um, but it, it's, basically, uh, it's basically a sham because look, when you have mass atrocity crimes that are going on, the norm, and I mean the norm, this is just what normally happens. There is a convoy of lies that are, that are put forward to try to protect the people who are perpetuating and perpetrating these mass atrocities. Uh, these lies are spun and put forward regularly to try to uh, hide, mask, uh, rationalize, deny um, mass atrocity crimes when they take place. Because mass atrocity crimes, what do I mean by that? Genocide crimes against humanity, war crimes are so horrific that, again, any decent person, anyone with even a half well-formed conscience would have to say these are horribly unjust and should stop. And so they try to mask them. They try to hide them in all these different lies. And so that is the norm. Uh, this is a regime and a sort of regime that is so unjust that over time, over the course of a substantial length of time, historically speaking, uh, a regime like this cannot continue along these lines. Uh, it will either implode upon itself or um, be changed from the outside, as the case may be, or some combination of the two. And given the horrific nature of the crimes that are being committed en masse uh, in North Korea, uh, this is something that should be swept into the dustbin of history, one way or another. Ideally, there would be some sort of um, peaceful way in which that happens, uh, and that you can have also a reunified Korea, and um, and and for this to all happen at best um, peacefully. But um, one way or another, uh, this cannot, this should not, this ought not to persist. This state of rightlessness that is pervasive uh, inside of North Korea. There's a lot more I can say, but, um, but that's, that's a little bit about, uh, about what is happening in regards to human rights in North Korea. Thank you. Thank you. So we learned about a huge number of 15 million people the North Korean regime murdered. So in 
concentration camp and in the FEMI of 90s, we heard about the enormous execution. So um, we need uh, international humanitarian intervention. Oh, by the way, this is uh, Dr. Most, uh, Tan's, Ambassador Mostan's book about that one. So peaceful way uh, for the people in North Korea. And also we care them with moral responsibility. Okay. Then next, so we uh, into uh, welcome uh, executive director of uh, HRNK, uh, Mr. Greg Scalatru. So Committee for Human Rights in North Korea. As you may know, HRNK is the best organization the human rights research about North Korea. So located in Washington, DC. So then Greg Scalatu, prize yours. Dear friends, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I am delighted to join you. It's uh, always a pleasure and an honor to participate in uh, events organized and run by uh, the Global Peace Foundation. Let me thank my uh, good and dear friend Kenji Sawai in particular for um, engaging me in this endeavor. Uh, today we are discussing this very important issue of uh, sending information into North Korea. Fundamentally, as far as the United States is concerned, as far as like-minded friends, partners, and allies, such as South Korea, Japan, and the European Union are concerned, we need to remember that we are facing a grave threat on the Korean Peninsula. It's a threat that combines the dozens of nuclear weapons that North Korea possesses, the long range ballistic missiles that North Korea possesses, and also the crimes against humanity that the North Korean regime continues to commit, regrettably, um, still um, almost um, a, uh, a decade after the UN Human Rights Council decided to establish by consensus a UN Commission of Inquiry dedicated to looking into the regime's human rights abuses and crimes against humanity. So what is there to do? Well, the first answer is apply the dime, D-I-M-E, the four fundamental elements of national power, diplomacy, information, military power, and economic power. What about the D? Of course, the North Korean regime has breached each and every international agreement it has ever entered. One could go back to the 1994 Geneva Agreed Framework. They decided to, to breach the terms of that agreement and develop a uh, clandestine uranium enrichment program. The six party talks, same story. Um, the Lead Day Agreement um, of, um, of February 2012, right after Kim Jong un assumed power, the same story. Ambassador Glenn Davis, uh, at the time, U.S. Special Envoy for North Korea policy met with uh, Kim Kegwon uh, and uh, the North Koreans pledged to uh, halt nuclear testing, ballistic missiles. Two weeks later, they announced a so-called satellite launch. They proceeded uh, with a missile launch that failed two days ahead of the centennial anniversary of uh, Kim Il-sung's birthday in December of the same year. They did manage to place an object into orbit. Uh, but to make a long story short, uh, despite the utter lack of credibility on the North Korean side, and we should blame failure of diplomacy on the North Koreans, not on the USA or the South Koreans, but despite those failures, 
Uh, just like many of you or all of you, I'm a student and practitioner of diplomacy. Diplomacy must continue. Military power, I'm skipping the I because today we're really talking about the I. The M um, in the dime, uh, of course, military power is very important. Um, strong deterrence is very important. Strong containment is very important. A, a strong U.S.-South Korea alliance is critical. A strong U.S.-Japan alliance is critical. So we need to continue to cherish our oh, friendship, partnership, alliance with the Republic of Korea and Japan. Economic power, of course, very important. The E in the dime. Uh, we do have a um, sanctions regime in place grounded in um, UN Security Council resolutions. We also have um, sanctions here on the, the, the US side, sanctions um, established by the US Congress, other allies, the European Union, Japan, of course, and other allies do have sanctions in place. These sanctions are meant, well, when it comes to UN sanctions, the sanctions are meant first and foremost to prevent, number one, to prevent the development and proliferation of North Korean nuclear weapons and missiles. Number two, to uh, punish the elites in charge of that development and proliferation by severing their access to uh, hard currency and luxury goods coming from the outside world. Are there negative adverse effects uh, affecting the people of North Korea? We don't know because we do not have access inside the country. So access is of the essence. Uh, we do have a new UN special rapporteur on the situation of human rights in the DPRK, Professor Elizabeth Salmon. We do have a um, new um, South Korean ambassador at large on North Korean human rights, Professor Yi Shin Hwa of Korea University. Um, and perhaps this, uh, well, I hope this will be at the very top of their agenda, uh, requesting access inside the country to assess the humanitarian situation of North Korea. Why not assess side effects of sanctions? If there are any, again, sanctions do not target the people of North Korea, but um, the, the only way to tell whether sanctions do have a negative effect on the people of North Korea is by means of having access inside the country, by means of having UN officials go inside the country and conduct um, in country assessments. So, um, again, the E in the dime is a very important uh, element, a very important aspect. And now, let me go back to the I, which I initially skipped. Information is extraordinarily important. This is a regime that has stayed in power at least since the creation, the establishment of the DPRK, the Democratic People's Republic of Korea in 1948 by means of uh, unprecedented coercion, control, surveillance, and punishment. This is a regime that has gone to great lengths to prevent the people of North Korea from gaining access to information from the outside world, um, across three regimes, the regime of Kim Il-sung, Kim Jong-il, and Kim Jong-un. North Korea does need change. Eventually, and the Global Peace Foundation, let me commend the Global Peace Foundation for this vision of a unified Korea, a unified Republic of Korea, a unified Republic of Korea that is strong, peaceful, democratic, capitalist, market-oriented, prosperous, a staunch ally, friend, and partner 
of the United States. So how do we get there? I'm not talking uh, bloody revolution, regime change, but I'm talking change enacted by the only people who can actually enact change. And these are the very people of North Korea. What can we do in the outside world to empower the people of North Korea? What we can do is to, to send them information from the outside world, information basically telling them three fundamental stories. First, the story of the corruption of their leadership, especially the corruption of the Kim family regime. Second, the story of the outside world, especially free, democratic, prosperous, economic powerhouse, the world's 10th largest economy, South Korea. And third, the story of their own human rights, which they don't know. Let me go back to the corruption of the regime. Um, North Korea is a very strange hybrid. Entrepreneurship coexists with totalitarian regime control. Private property is not allowed in North Korea. So North Koreans operate trucks, taxis, cars, and as private entrepreneurs, but they do not hold property titles. In order to run those businesses, they need to register their vehicles, and this is just an example, under powerful government agencies, under the protection of powerful government agents. This is a recipe for great corruption, a great degree of corruption, a high degree of corruption. And North Koreans need to understand that this is not how economies should operate. Of course, North Koreans, many North Koreans know today much more about the, the, the outside world, including South Korea, than they did 10, 15, or 20 years ago. Of course, uh, K-pop, K-drama, anything K, these are very powerful drivers of interest in South Korean success. They do need to understand that South Korea is the other Korea, a very successful alternative to the Kim family regime's North Korea. And they do need to understand that the formula for Korean success is not the totalitarian dictatorship of the DPRK, but the very successful ROK, human rights. Another extraordinarily important story. Uh, North Korea joined the United Nations at the same time as South Korea in uh, 1991. Uh, North Korea assumed international obligations as it became a UN member state. Uh, North Korea is bound by the UN Universal Declaration of Human Rights. North Korea acceded to the two covenants in 1982, nine years before it joined the, UA, uh, the, the UN, the um, International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights the uh, International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. It has joined uh, the Women's Convention, the Children's Convention, the Convention on the Rights of People with uh, Disabilities, and yet each and every conceivable human right is violated in North Korea. If you look at the constitution of the DPRK, if you look at the, the labor legislation of the DPRK, uh, but you will see that, you know, there are these wonderful stipulations that supposedly on paper protect uh, freedom of religion, freedom of assembly, and yet, in fact, none of these rights are observed. All that matters in the DPRK is the TPMI, the 10 Principles of Monolithic Ideology and Kim Il-sungism information campaigns coming in from the outside world must enable North Koreans to understand that there is a very deep rift between their constitution and their ideology. There is a very deep rift 
between international obligations that North Korea has assumed and Kim il Songism, the TPMI, the 10 principles of monolithic ideology. Ultimately, why are we doing this? I have been a student and practitioner of Korean Peninsula issues for the past 32 years. There are so many others of us out there. What we ultimately want is reconciliation, peace, unification of the Korean Peninsula under a free, democratic, prosperous Republic of Korea. This is the ultimate key to resolving the North Korean conundrum. Nukes, missiles, egregious human rights violations and crimes against humanity. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, we learned dime, uh, democrat, uh, diplomacy and information, military and uh, economic power. Uh, which UNCOI report uh, asked it for changing inside North Korea for the people. So also we learned the importance of sending information into North Korea about the first corruption of uh, in North Korea, corruption in North Korea. Second, free information uh, of outside into North Korea. And uh, third, uh, human rights. <laughs> The solution of the human rights and the uh, nuclear problem uh, is free and unified Korea. Uh, next, so uh, we uh, welcome uh, Dr. Nathan Isok Shin. Uh, he's a legal counsel at Seoul based human rights documentation, NGO. Transitional Justice Working Group, PJWG, and a lecture of international law at the Catholic University of Korea. Also recently, he was invited hearing of Tom Lanto's Human Rights Commission by United States Congress, uh, like uh, uh, Congressman Smith. Okay. Now, oh, Dr. Nathan Singh, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Sawai. Let me just uh, share the PowerPoint uh, slides with you. Okay. Ah, does everyone have the view? Okay, thank you. <laughs> right. Uh, so, as uh, Mr. Sawai just kindly introduced uh, me, I am Ethan Hizang Shen uh, of the Transitional Justice Working Group or, or TJWG. A short introduction of our group uh, TJWG was established in 2014 and has a multinational staff uh, based in uh, Seoul. Uh, well, I will first briefly explain about the work that TJW has been doing uh, to further transitional justice, uh, which is a set of uh, measures taken after uh, the democratic transition uh, to realize justice and accountability uh, for pre-transitional atrocities uh, and human rights violations, as is the case in North Korea. Our TJWG's uh, flashing mapping project uh, documents uh, state-sanctioned killings, uh, most no notably public executions in North Korea, uh, based on interviews uh, of uh, over 600 escapees, uh, where we use uh, Google Earth uh, type uh, solution to not only collect testimonies, but also geolocation information about the place where the victims are killed, where the bodies are buried, and where the related uh, government documents uh, may be housed. So uh, the, uh, this is actually a picture from our late, most latest report uh, in 2021, uh, uh, locate, locating uh, key offices in the city of Hesan near the North Chinese border. Uh, 
Uh, you can see also the killing sites, the mostly mostly of uh, public executions, and also uh, where the public trials uh, have taken place uh, in, in the city of Hassan. Uh, <clears throat> okay, and our next project, second project, main project is Footprints, which is the online database of the people arrested, uh, abducted, or disappeared uh, by North Korean government. Uh, Footprints is actually uh, uh, is provides this kind of online database repository of information that our partner organizations uh, have collected uh, over the years, uh, so that it can be made public, publicly available, and help to raise global awareness and visibility of this issue. Uh, so these are some snapshots from our Footprints website. Uh, you can see the top bar and uh, the actually the main page uh, where you can uh, look you can type in the names of the people who have gone missing in North Korea, uh, both of the North Korean citizens and also people from South Korea, uh, Japan, and other countries as well. Uh, so these are the snapshots uh, from our online database, uh, also from uh, Footprints uh, website. Uh, okay. And our next project, which kind of leads on from the, the, the mapping report and also the footprints online database, uh, is the what we call the map the mapping of the chain of command uh, in North Korea. Uh, so this new project uh, will seek to identify and uh, collect evidence against uh, North Korean officials who are really responsible for the crimes against humanity taking place there. Now, government officials like Kim Jong-un obviously do not personally execute people or arrest people or torture people. Uh, they order uh, their underlings to carry out such crimes. And uh, it's always very difficult to actually find uh, credible evidence to convict uh, or prosecute uh, the higher level uh, officials in trials. So TJWG plans to uh, contribute to this effort by systematically collecting information on these three fronts, uh, namely how many police uh, or military uh, units exist in, in North Korea and the, at which uh, administrative levels, uh, what, what, what uh, unit has control over which area, uh, and who the individuals that are in charge of the respective uh, uh, units or command uh, structures. Uh, so, as I said, we will try to link this information uh, from the our work uh, previously done uh, with the uh, mapping project and also the uh, online database, uh, the footprint database. And we and we will also share. Uh, we we will also be working together with our partner organizations, uh, including Daily Daily NK, uh, which was founded by our first uh, uh, our first uh, speaker of the session. Mr. Sung Gwangju, and uh, go, go forward with uh, uh, from there. Uh, <clears throat> another prospective work that we have concerned the uh, the the suspected uh, suspected radioactive contamination uh, from the groundwater sources in the Pungeri test site area. Uh, as we know, as we all know, uh, North Korea has conducted six uh, nuclear tests in the Pungeri. Uh, uh, site over the past uh, from 2006 to 2017, and uh, it may well as well resume uh, these nuclear tests any any moment. And there have been reports uh, or rumors of mysterious diseases uh, afflicting the residents living in that area. And uh, the South Korean government actually conducted a number of uh, medical tests on the North Korean defectors or escapees uh, from that region. Uh, which showed actually showed a lot of anomalies. So all this uh, is actually a source of concern for uh, many of us, uh, because not least because there are over seven hundred thirty thousand uh, people living in within the forty kilometer radius of the Pungeri two test sites. Uh, unfortunately, our former government under President Moon has been very reluctant to conduct medical tests on the uh, defectors. So we are hoping that the new government will, will reconsider this uh, uh, previous government's policy. Uh, so now that we've talked bro broadly about the work that TJWG has been doing, 
uh, let's uh, discuss how the new UN government uh, can contribute to this kind of transitional justice efforts concerning North Korea. Uh, first, there are over 50,000 uh, South Korean POWs in North Korea, and it's very it's imperative for the South Korean government to create a fact finding commission uh, and also a dedicated office within the Ministry of uh, Defense uh, to uh, look into this matter and also continue, continue to press North Korea to return uh, the, North, the POWs uh, that they're still holding. Uh, similarly, uh, there are also thousands of civilian abductees uh, from both the war, war during the wartime and also since the, uh, since after the armistice agreement that are being held in North Korea that are still being held in North Korea. Uh, again, uh, the moon, the Yoon Sung-yeol government should press North Korea uh, for their return and also raise this issue with China, uh, which is also partially responsible for some of the um, abductions and assassinations. Uh, that have taken place against South Korean citizens uh, in this territory. Uh, another issue, pressing issue of concern, uh, is the over 11, at least 11,170 11, North Korean escape piece uh, and more that are being held in uh, both China and Russia, uh, waiting for their forced repatriation to uh, North Korea uh, until the, the COVID lockdown, uh, border lockdown ends. Uh, so again, this is a matter that the, the new government should take with urgency. Uh, similarly, we need we've had the uh, the incident where two North Korean defect uh, uh, defectors were returned to North Korea by the Moon Jae-in government in November 2019. Uh, the new government should uh, implement uh, institute legal reforms as well as conducting the criminal investigations into this matter. Uh, also, the uh, the Kwaliso or the political prison camps in North Korea is uh, one of the most, uh, arguably the most grievous uh, human rights violations taking place in North Korea. Uh, again, uh, I think the new government should take more more, more protect, proactive position uh, to call for its closure, their closure, and also for to negotiate the release of the political prisoners in, in North Korea. Uh, for your expression. Uh, Again, the new government should reverse the policy of uh, uh, the anti-leafleting law, which was enacted by the administration, and actually support uh, information dissemination in, within North Korea. Uh, it should also call for North Korea to abolish the anti-reactionary thought law and other laws that limit, that restrict the freedom of expression and uh, thought and religion in North Korea. Uh, I also have a set of uh, recommendations concerning the death penalty in North Korea uh, that I will not uh, get into details in the interest of time. Uh, again, I already touched upon the Punjeri uh, nuclear test site issue. Uh, in terms of the of furthering justice and accountability, it's imperative that the new government uh, actually review uh, what was what the the unification ministry has done for the. Uh, documentation of North Korean uh, human rights violations or what it has not uh, done so for in the past five years. And also seriously consider transferring this uh, very important task from the unification minist ministry to the justice ministry, uh, because this kind of uh, documentation uh, should definitely always have in mind future criminal investigation and prosecution for crimes against humanity. Uh, again, the government should South Korean government should press for North Korea's um, uh, uh, ratification of the, the important treaties that it has uh, thus far failed to ratify, and also call for its actual implementation. Uh, so, what is the chance? How 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 much expectation can we have for the new government? Uh, that's still an uh, open question. Uh, obviously, it's still it's still too early to tell the, uh, Yoon Sung Yeol's broader uh, North Korean policy orientation, and uh, it's actually not so encouraging that uh, his 110 uh, key uh, policy tasks, Bukjong uh, did not have a separate heading under North Korean human rights. Now, uh, it, the Yoon government, even if it has the political will, will still face opposition from the National Assembly, uh, which is dom still dominated by the opposition. Democratic Party for at least about two years, and uh, it will always be a challenge to galvanize the international community uh, or to diplomatically engage uh, North Korea uh, and China and Russia. 
uh, other key areas for improving North Korean human rights uh, by the new government includes uh, these issues. Uh, again, raising public awareness. Uh, there have been some uh, positive signs. Uh, President Yoon invited uh, three South Korean POWs to his inaugurational ceremony in uh, in May. And just this week, uh, when uh, one of the POWs uh, passed away, he actually sent his defense minister to the funeral ceremony, uh, which was a, a big break from the previous government. Uh, it was a very all, all this is a very con constructive sign, and uh, he probably should do this for the civilian abductees and uh, the, uh, and uh, um, the North Korean SKPs as well. Uh, also, the UN is an important forum for raising these North Korean human rights issues. Uh, so North, South Korea needs to speak up more uh, when it comes to the North Korean human rights resolutions, uh, making speeches at the General Assembly and the Human Rights Council. And uh, it should also utilize the upcoming uh, Universal Period Review for Russia, China, and, the, and North Korea. Uh, again, uh, so the UN government will be hampered by the opposition dominated National Assembly, but fortunately there is a lot of area where he can actually implement policies through executive actions. Uh, so there's really no excuse for the new government not calling for a more functioning UN accountability mechanism uh, or filing briefs uh, in the lawsuits brought by the POWs and abductees against North Korea and South Korean courts. Uh, again, uh, I'm not against personally against this kind of inter-Korean dialogue, but uh, it should definitely include uh, in, in the uh, in the meeting agenda uh, the issue of returning uh, and uh, returning or repatriating POWs and uh, civilian abductees, uh, as well as the general improvement of uh, human rights in North Korea. Uh, and uh, this issue has kind of fallen out of uh, uh, fashion now, but. Uh, there was a big discussion of uh, of an uh, end of war de declaration uh, with North Korea under the previous uh, administration. Uh, even in the unlikely, if in the unlikely event that uh, this kind of end of war declaration or peace treaty uh, is signed on to by North Korean earnest, it should at a minimum at least include the uh, immediate return of the POWs and abductees, as well as the, some some reference to the international human rights principles. Uh, so in the limited time I had, I tried to convey the, the picture of transitional justice uh, policies uh, for North Korea. Uh, thank you very much. Wow, thank you. So really brilliant presentation. The concept of transitional justice is an important concept when free and unified Korea happen, realized. So we need to prepare legal document and also database and the system uh, before chaos will be happen. So thank you very much. Uh, so then next, so we welcome uh, Miss Eiko Kawasaki. Uh, Eiko Kawasaki is the chairman of Action for Korea United in Japan and the founder of Korea of All. Modu Moija. She is second generation of Korean Japanese woman and was repatriated to North Korea uh, with 93,340 people. And she had lived in North Korea for 43 years and defected and went back to Japan in 2004. Please listen to her speech as a living witness.
Hello, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Eiko Kawasaki. I was born in Japan as a second generation of Chinese Korean. And in the 1960s, when I was 17 years old, third year of high school, I went to North Korea. I was deceived by false propaganda of North Korea and Cho Chong Yun. And in 43 years, I defected, risking my life, and came back to Japan. At the time, there were 600,000 to 700,000 Chinese Koreans living in Japan, but more than 98% of them were from southern part of the Korean Peninsula. North Korea deceived people who had no ties to North Korea and took them to make up for the labor force in the heavy labor sector in North Korea. So they deceived people with a forest propaganda. Zainichi Koreans who went to North Korea not only suffer, suffered human rights violation at the bottom of a social class, being treated with a disdain and contempt, but also were beaten to death and starved to death and caught in severe poverty with no guarantee of clothes and food. That was a dire situation we experienced in North Korea. Many were tortured to death and taken to concentration camp. They lived day by day in fear, and many of them are dying in such hardship. In 43 years, I defected from North Korea. I risked my life. I thought I can't be there anymore and escaped North Korea with the determination that I should go out and let the international community know about this tragedy, even if I had to risk my life. Luckily, I was able to return to Japan safely. When I returned, I thought I must do what I can do as a person who returned to the free world alive and wrote a book while working part-time. The title of the book is Stories of People Who Went to North Korea from Japan. This is not a record about my personal life, but a non-fiction book about what happened to those who were deceived by North Korea and the Cho Chong Yun and boarded the ferry to North Korea. So this is an actual story. So in the year 2007, this book was published in Japanese. And also the Korean version of this book was published last year with the help of many to whom I'm very grateful. And English translation is in progress by Japanese collaborators to publish an English version. After coming back to Japan, I continue to work to address illegality of the North Korean repatriation project. And finally, last year, on October 14, 2021, five defectors raised a trial against North Korea's Kim Jong-un and sued for 100 million yen damages per person at the Tokyo District Court in Japan. The news of this trial, the first of its kind, was reported all over the world. So I believe many of you know about this trial. Some might think we lost the trial at the Tokyo Code but actually not.
we raised one single trial for the following two facts. One is that North Korea did force propaganda under the direction of Kim Il-sung and made 93,340 people board the ship to North Korea. And the other is that none of those who went to North was able to leave North Korea. But the Japanese court looked at those two cases separately and ruled that the former is judged guilty of the crime, while the later falls outside the juris jurisdiction of the Japanese court. Although the former was ruled as a crime, the court said damages cannot be received because it had been a very long time. That was the, the decision from the Tokyo court we had. So as I said, the Japanese court um, they will look into these cases into two different the cases. Anyhow, in part, we won this case. Now, we are going through the process of appealing to high court as a next step. If the high court rules differently from what we believe, we will take this case to the Supreme Court and reveal the human right violation in North Korean repatriation project to the world. Our activities are not only limited to letting the world know about the crimes of North Korea. We are also working on leaving the historical evidence. We are working on leaving the repatriation of Chinese Koreans to North Korea, which is said to be the grandest human rights violation of the end of World War II as evidence of history. This is a Niigata Willow Street Renewal Project. On November 7, 1959, the people scheduled to boot the first North Korean repatriation ship and the Japanese people who are cooperating with the project such as the Japan Korea Association and Repatriation Cooperation Association and the Japan Teachers Union joined the force to plant 306 willow trees in the street of Niigata city and donated them to Niigata prefecture in commemoration for the Japan-Korea friendship and the departure, departure of the first shipping line to the north and left the mark there. So this is called Niigata Willow Street Renewal Project. But as the long doing of North Korean repatriation project was revealed, and many years have passed with the negligence of Chu chong -yeon. Currently, only about 80 willow trees are barely surviving on the street. We are not only going to restore this willow tree street, but also build a museum that inform the world of injustice of North Korean repatriation project. We also plan to build a monument that commemorate the name of all 93,340 people who were sent to North Korea on the ship. By doing so, we will be able to leave tangible evidence of the long doing of North Korea. So this Nigata Willow project and the trial against Kim Jong-un 
those two projects are undergoing. So by having these projects, we want to rebuild the problem and the crime of North Korea. So all the people around the world know about this crime done by North Korea. And by doing so, we hope that this kind of a horrendous crime will not be repeated again. So North Korea have the three generation autocracy. By having these two projects, we can make uh, changes. That is our hope. So by having this Willow project, we can make Niigata as a symbol of freedom and justice. So when we think about the democracy, we can think about Niigata, and also we can think about the Niigata at the street museum. So all these stories can be shared with many people. And the Niigata can be the place to learn about democracy. And this story can be you know, the, included in the children's textbook. And also Niigata can be the field trip site to learn about freedom and the democracy. So this can be the meaningful project we can implement in Niigata. By doing so, we can also contribute for the well development of Niigata as well. This project will be costly and thus our organization alone cannot make it. So this requires the help of Korean and Japanese government as well as those who want to protect the freedom and the democracy around the world. And in order to have um, the unifications, many people like you are making great e effort. So I'd like to ask your continuous support as well. As I said, when I was 17, I went to North Korea. And for about 43 years, I had to separate from my family. And when I came back to uh, Japan, and I uh, have a uh, freedom, but still my 12 family members are still living in North Korea. So my, uh, the well, four children and my spouse and my grand, the children are still living in North the Korea because of the, well, the autocracy in North Korea. When I do not I'd have um, the contact with my family members. I have a sleepless night every night. This is um, the horrendous crime indeed. So I hope that the philosophy of Hong Yik In Gan the philosophy supported by AKU can be realized and I will join my effort to realize that. I ask all of you to join your effort as well. When Korean Peninsula is unified, we can have um, the peace uh, in the 21st century across the world. To conclude my story, I hope that all of you who are present, present uh, today will take the initiative and the support to this project I introduced today. I am the chairwoman of uh, the IKU Japan. Thank you. Uh, help her for uh, meeting.
uh, uh, have uh, children and also grandchildren. So I think many audience uh, didn't know about the reputation, 93,340, many, many uh, Korean uh, from Japan reported. So we need to establish a, such a memorial uh, because for the learning the history, we should, uh, shouldn't make uh, the human rights violation again. Okay. So next, uh, we would like to introduce uh, Ms. Ji Hyun Park. So she's a uh, North Korean defector, uh, human rights activist, and the course of the hard road out new book he, she wrote. Ms. Park is the first North Korean refugee nominated for local election in the United Kingdom. So she also uh, activity for political area also. Recently, she attended the International Ministerial Conference, UK Freedom of Religion and Belief Forum. And Ms. Park, uh, floor is yours. Thank you so much for this great opportunity and uh, thank you for audience having me today. So uh, I have been uh, living in the UK for 14 years now. So you know that I would change myself personally. First, I speak English. So I know I, uh, my English is not perfect, but I speak English. And also, I am a freedom person in the UK. Uh, and also, you know, the human rights activities. Uh, so this most important thing is that uh, I joined the Conservative Party in 2017. Uh, it's the first North Korean. And also, stand up for conservative candidate in 2021 and 2022. That is the first North Korean defector who lives in outside the world. And also first North Korean um, defector speak to uh, United Kingdom's conservative party. So I was uh, one in uh, last 2021. So I really believe that is a miracle of my life and uh, is uh, miraculous. So Korean Bob said that uh, in 10 years, even mountains and the rivers will be changing. So Kim Il-sung died almost 30 years, and uh, Kim Jong-il died this uh, past decades. And the situation of the Korean Peninsula changed a lot. But uh, but in a uh, retrospect, North Korea is a still poor country with bad luck. The people living there are the most miserable in the world who have never had access to the freedom, market economy, and the human rights. And the vast majority of the world's population has enjoyed for a long time. After that, under the Kim Il-sung communist dynasty, the Korean compatriots are forced to die if the Kim Il-sung family dies and they live if they lie. A country where hundreds of thousands of innocent people are executed for refusing to become the slaves of the Kim Il-sung clan. Their wives and the children are imprisoned for life in a political prison camp uh, for conspiracy and forced to be exterminated for the third generations without the brutal mounts or tombstones. It's the, uh, in the present era, not in ancient times, the body of Kim Il-sung, the internal slave owner, both living and dead, is the land of ghosts where millions of innocent residents uh, starved to death for the constructions of the palace. 
the country for a single generation that is growing up and growing into a generation with deformities that cannot be called uh, forever due to hunger and malnutrition, and where countless women who escaped North Korea are sold into slavery in other countries to survive. So in 1990s, this North Korea was bombing. So that time is evil Kim Jong-il. He said that even if 10 million more died of starvation in the future, we can protect the system with the party and the military alone. All those two evils, Kim Il-sung and Kim Jong-il already died. North Korea is a country where a pseudo religion exists that still worship ghosts. So through my work, I met many NGOs and human rights activists, activists who all agree that North Korea is the number one abuser of human rights. But strangely, they rarely don't understand North Korea system and ideologies. Many experts and politicians only say that kind of diplomatic works, open economics, give up nuclear weapons, then one day North Korea is collapsed. But that's wrong. So myself, a human rights activist, so I visited many universities, schools, and the speak in parliament. So I still remember one of the questions uh, this is a student, she is a South Korean, but studied uh, studies in um, abroad in Germany. So she mentioned that in Europe also many socialism countries, that's why we only speak about the North Korea systems. So when I got this question, I was shocking because she doesn't understand in European social democratic countries is Sahe Minjuji. Because North Korea is not Sahe Minjuji. North Korea system is socialism, Sahwejui, Zhenjiji, Dokte. So I was so shocking because how does she got information and what does she know about the North Korea issues? So that is not only her problems, it's now it's many, many younger people and also many Western people, they don't understand this system because in Western countries already experienced a lot is Stalin, uh, Stalinism, Marx Leninism and Nazism, but they not have this uh, kind of totalitarian uh, systems in their uh, lifetimes. So we have to tell it to them with North Korea systems. So before is the founder Song uh, Gwangju, uh, this uh, the deputy already mentioned that North Korea classification is a Songbun system and also ten principles ship day one So that is really important issues because many many people they don't understand the classification systems and also time principles. So classification system also changed the 2000, 2000s. Uh, and then uh, we knew only old systems and we still not know the, about the new systems because it's still not complete. And also time principle of loyalty to Kim Il-sung. That's announced the, uh, before Kim Il-sung's birthday in Port in April in 1974. Uh, but this the principle also changed in 2013 after Kim Jong-un took the control of the country. So before they mentioned the only loyalty to Kim Il-sung, but now changed to loyalty to Kim Il-sung and Kim Jong-il. So that is a ten, uh, this the, Ten principally are the absolute standard by which political prisoners are judged, transcending the constitution and the criminal law. 
And the lastly is a Juche ideology, is the totalitarianism, is a Juche ideology. So people never know to understand these systems. So we have to tell about the people, uh, these systems, and continue to teaching our young people. And also my, my self human rights activities, and I continue to sharing the people and the teaching to them. Uh, the whole country is modern slavery, and the state is uh, driving its citizens into human trafficking and the forced labor. So most people don't understand the human trafficking and the modern slavery uh, issues because of the Many people think that that is a human trafficking is individuals, but North Korea, the state uh, is driving its citizens into human trafficking and the forced labor. So in order including the child forced labor, child forced solidars, and housewife forced, uh, forced labor, and the forced labor abroad in workers, and also is the 17 years old girls, they performed and the dancing the smiles in front is the government, is kind of a deep boom job. And they also forced the level to outside the countries and in a restaurant, they selling the their smiles in front of customers and they earn the money and they send to the it's North Korea. So that is a whole human trafficking issues and also modern day slavery issues. But many people can't notice it, uh, these issues. So I continue to remind the people about the, these issues. So last 10 years, you know, the, the, I've seen that is the North Korea, is the, inside the North Korea, many younger people and the women have uh, to change the, because the, in the 1990s is a famine and then many females stand up and they respond with their families. So is that the, you know, the females, is that, uh, they escaped North Korea and they kidnapped the human trafficking in China. But the first they got uh, new information from outside the countries than men. So uh, they own the money and send the money to North Korea and save their families. And the many women also the, go to South Korea, and they also the, have to learn capitalism systems first, mm? and also earn the money and send it to North Korea. So it's women's power is now lots of changes inside North Korea, and they saved a lot of the, the, their family members. But one thing I really angry about that is many experts and the students and the professionals who worked about the North Korea women's rights and this, most people they mentioned gender equality and the feminism. But that is wrong because it's North Korea is destroyed the, the human rights issues, it's basic issues. So gender equality and uh, feminism issues not improved any uh, North Korean women's human rights issues. So we have to remember that this, uh, this world is a published women's rights. So this name is came out in 1992 is Vienna declarations. And also women's rights are human rights. That's mentioned in 1995 in Beijing uh, declarations. So women's human rights issues are still in ongoing and it's still many women supporting. So if someone works in North Korea women's human rights issues, and so they just is a focus, they just is a be careful looking about gender equality or feminism. And secondly, is the information. So I know that, is, that is a director uh, Greg Scarlett already mentioned information. So I know that is information is really important and uh, information uh, meaning is not only K-drama, uh, uh, K-pop, K-movies. Uh, information meaning is double thinking. So North Korean people who are born in North Korea we all destroyed our thinking because we are all slaves. So we 
maybe no that is uh, thinking ourselves because it's always a regime told to us this country is great and uh, it's not into envy so we believe that this this meaning is North Korea is a regime is always uh, is destroyed and killing our, our thinking but after is 2000s after is 1990s and many informations uh, is come to the you know, North Korea and then younger people they started thinking outside the countries so that is really really important the double thinking so that's why information is a really important issues so it's the last well, final is I just is a conclusions is how we end this human traffic and the modern slavery systems because why I mentioned these issues because that is a global issues so we have to work or together in 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 you know in world so human trafficking and the modern slavery are crimes that still cannot be considered in the histories so talk understanding the core causes of human trafficking human rights activities and the other development experts many begin to address the issues as the base levels we have to learn that is North Korea human uh, trafficking and the modern slavery issues and the people are talking and the communities are rising and the global networks are fighting and the world governments are responding responding to the united message that human trafficking the most end and the last point is that statelessness people because north korean people not right to get their passport so they can't move freely and not safe abroad that is why china always send back to north koreans to north korea so i will urgently the world we need a temporary passport to north korean people who live in china and save to them from dictator country so your silence will not protect you and the future. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, we must end the human trafficking. We can be silent. Then now we can buy her book, The Hard Road Out, on Kindle store in the world. Then the paper book is sold in UK and also Australia. Uh, by the way, in USA, the uh, actual paper book will be available in January next year. The next, we move to Q&A session. Please write your question using Q&A button bottom your screen. So then, uh, the first question so, um, from Pakistan. So I'm a Pakistan Christian and now seeking uh, asylum in Spain. Your address is very impressive in, in which you gave an example of human rights violations. I agree with you. Should we now prepare for a new war in Korea after the war in Ukraine. So I think so, Mr. Dr. Jinshin, you are the uh, specialist about the international relations. So how about the, do you think the uh, new war in Korean Peninsula? How do you think? Yes. Oh yeah, that, that's a very um, critical question and a very important question. Thank you for uh, uh, your comment. Um, uh, yeah, I I'm speaking. Um, 이번에 그 러시아와 우크라이나 전쟁으로 인해서 because of the war in between Russia and Ukraine, China and North Korea, I think have learned something very significant strategically. Ukraine possesses nuclear weapons. However, Ukraine, Ukra Ukraine uh, became independent from Russia, Soviet Union and 
formed a state and the US and Russia and other countries, excuse me, uh, the US and other countries decided to defend Ukraine despite its possession of nuclear weapons. However, now, even though the even though Ukraine is at war with Russia, uh, the U.S. and other countries were not are not able to send their weapons to Ukraine. So this means that uh, nuclear weapons cannot guarantee the safety of the state. This is one first message, and the U.S. ROK alliance is now in place. But if uh, China shows any signs of being involved in the any potential second Korean war, then even the US, which is in alliance with South Korea, will be likely to be hesitant to get involved in the war with China. In that sense, South Korea uh, needs to reinforce a US ROK alliance. However, even with the strengthened US ROK alliance, I believe the US might not uh, strongly be involved in the war with China. Uh, to make that happen, I think South Korea needs to persuade the US to be uh, proactively involved in any possible war against China. And to that end, uh, South Korea needs to carry out its a uh, role in, so that the uh, U.S. will have faith in the U.S. ROK alliance and get involved in any potential war on the Korean Peninsula. So if the U.S. shows such a uh, will to be involved in any potential war on the Korean Peninsula, then I believe China will not get involved in any Korean, a second Korean war. So when Nancy Pelosi visited Taiwan this time, uh, China, uh, try to uh, encircle Taiwan, eventually breaking the peace between Taiwan and China. So I think there is a possibility, high possibility that China might try to uh, occupy Taiwan by force. In that means uh, South Korea Tries, should try to reinforce the US ROK alliance. And even if China uh, tries to participate in the Korean War, then the US should be involved. And the US needs to show its willingness to get involved in the Second Korean War so that it can dissuade China from uh, getting involved in any potential Korean War. Uh, North Korea is considered a strategic asset because it possesses nuclear weapons. So if it attacks South Korea or Japan, and if China at the same time attacks Taiwan, I believe the U.S. cannot uh, participate in both worlds. So this uh, will, this might have uh, sent a clear message to China that it needs to change its approach, strategic approach. I believe uh, South Korea can secure its safety by getting involved in the activities related to the US ROK alliance. Question uh, uh, So, next question What more care can be done? on both governmental and civil society levels, advance implementation, implementation of the UNCOI report recommendations. So somebody, could you raise a hand? So, Anyone who'd like to answer the question, please raise your hand. <laughs> yes, in 2014, the COI of the UN reported a lot of things and the materials were very sufficient. And there are two reports 
one is the, just the report and the other one was the retailed report. And the human rights uh, situation in North Korea was depicted as a crime against humanity in those reports. So that's how the human rights situation in North Korea was defined. So I believe the, uh, the implementation of the recommendations of the COI would mean uh, improving the human rights situation in North Korea in an ideal way. But now the reality is that investigation itself is very difficult because the investigation by international organizations into the North Korean nuclear human rights issue is now prevented by North Korea. So I believe the UN international community as well as South Korea needs to make efforts to even begin conversations about human rights with North Korea. And the support from the US as well as uh, the individual, uh, individual attempts to uh, begin discussions by the US and South Korea and other demo democratic countries uh, should be carried out simultaneously. In other words, multifaceted efforts are needed. But to that end, we need to make sure that North Korea understands that it's in their interest to be involved in the discussions about human rights with the international community. In other words, uh, Keeping the norms of the international community is in, their, is in the interest of North Korea. We need to persuade North Korea to understand that. In the past, uh, there was international pressure on North Korea about its public persecution, public executions. So North Korea was pressured to uh, try to at least uh, keep their public execution secret. And this shows that uh, pressure from the international community, continuous pressure is very important. And I think uh, that's the realistic approach to leading to, to uh, implement the recommendations by the UNCOI. Thank you for your answer. We need international cooperation on North Korea. So uh, bilateral cooperation or multilateral cooperation. We really uh, care North Korean people continually. Thank you very much. Uh, so, and also uh, Dr. Nathan Shin uh, raising hand. So please uh, reply. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, so I, first of all, completely agree with what uh, Mr. Song Gangju uh, just said. Uh, and uh, just want to add that um, uh, we let's uh, remember that eight years have passed uh, since the publication of the COI report in 2014. And I think uh, at this point, it's important uh, to continue the work of documentation of the uh, grave human rights violations in North Korea, which was what, North, what the COI report was about in 2014. And uh, I think uh, this is, something that really hasn't happened. Uh, it was actually something that the COI report uh, recommended that the, both the UN and the, internet, the domestic governments carry out. Uh, but as I said uh, earlier, as I explained earlier, the South Korean government really hasn't done much for documentation under the previous uh, Moon Jae-in government. And the United Nations um, has the, 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 uh, the Seoul OHCHR office is actually mandated to carry out this task, but for various reasons, uh, we're not really clear uh, about how much progress it has made. Uh, so I think it's really important to re-engage in this kind of uh, document, human rights documentation effort uh, to uh, make sure that uh, the violations taking place in North Korea uh, will at least one day be possible uh, to be held uh, accountable. Thank you. Yes, uh, transition, transitional justice working group really making really detailed documents. Really, we need it. Yes, please go ahead more. <laughs> Thank you very yeah. much for your effort. Yes, then uh, we will next uh, question. So the previous we received it. What international uh, 
efforts are being made to bring awareness of the human rights issue in North Korea to keep them accountable. So similar question, but somebody can reply about that. Uh, oh, yeah, uh, Dr. Shin. Uh, Thank you. Uh, yeah, so uh, again, uh, I think it's important. Uh, the documentation is important uh, for the purpose, uh, also not only for the this kind of future accountability, but also for the purpose of raising public awareness uh, about North Korean human rights issues. Precisely because North Korea is so good at this kind of state control, uh, and very few people can either can visit or leave North Korea. Uh, which means that uh, who can, th there are very few people who witness or videotape uh, the actual um, human rights violations taking place in North Korea. For example, we don't really have any actual like video footage of anyone getting publicly executed, getting uh, in, being killed in public executions. Even though every uh, almost every uh, North Korean SKP has uh, seen uh, seen uh, or heard about it. So uh, again, uh, I think uh, it's important to use these kind of uh, new methods to raise awareness about this issue. And uh, also I think it's important to engage the security uh, experts and uh, policymakers uh, so that in the event of some uh, negotiations uh, that they will feel the, the long-term interests in raising these uh, human rights issues. Uh, I briefly mentioned at the end of my presentation uh, the recent uh, uh, somewhat uh, shambolic discussion about the end of war declaration. Uh, but uh, basically, for example, the 1975 Helsinki Agreement uh, was actually a security uh, agreement between the what was the communist bloc and the Western bloc at the time, uh, with this very small chapter about human rights. And uh, as it turned out, that small chapter mentioning uh, discussing human rights was quite influential in bringing about uh, freedom and de democracy uh, in, within in the communist states. Uh, so again, I think it's important to actually uh, try to uh, raise this issue with the, uh, the government officials who, uh, who take part in these security negotiations uh, with North Korea so that this agenda does not get lost uh, in uh, any uh, future deals uh, or negotiations. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Uh, then um, not so much of time. So we go next uh, uh, question. So the DPRK is a major security threat. What can be done to ensure that any intergovernmental engagement with DPRK by the US, ROK, Japan, EU, etc. Does not focus exclusively on the security issue while sidelining human rights. Human rights is important. We should be including. So somebody can uh, answer this one. So how about Dr. Jinxin? Yes, what's your question? Uh, so, um, uh, negotiate, so when we negotiate uh, to uh, DPRK, so uh, how include uh, human rights agenda? Hmm. Uh, well, actually, many the well panelists shared their ideas about human rights. When we have a negotiation with North Korea, we do not have um, the in-depth discussions about human rights. Most of the discussion has been centered on nuclear weapons and the missile test. So when we want to include human rights issues as an agenda, North Korea refused to come to negotiation table. So well, um, the human rights issues, that is a very sensitive to North Korean regime. So it is um, difficult to raise those agenda. 
on the negotiation table. So when we have um, the negotiation, so it is uh, difficult to touch human rights issues. That is the actual reality. The international society can give some pressure regarding human rights issues. Then North Korea makes uh, subtle changes when they have a great pressure from international community. So North Korea is a rather sensitive about the international reputation. So I believe that international society should continue the pressures regarding human rights issues. Even though North Korea refused to come to negotiation table when human rights issues included, an international community never stopped to give pressure uh, on North Korea regarding human rights and the problems. So NGOs and the, the governments and all the stakeholders should provide great um, the opportunities to talk about human rights. Thank you. Thank you very much. So how about Dr. Eitan Singh? Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, uh, again, I agree with everything that uh, Dr. Shinjin just said. And uh, again, I, I will just add that uh, one other, I guess, uh, elephant in the room that uh, we did, just didn't discuss much is China. And uh, I, I did kind of briefly touched upon it, but uh, especially, for example, when it comes to the SKP's issue, uh, no, China is quite complicit in many of the uh, the uh, human rights violations that uh, arise uh, from and human rights, human trafficking that uh, happen uh, in uh, China. So uh, the COI actually said that stated that China is aiding and abetting crimes against humanity in North Korea. So I guess that's another uh, important player that. Uh, uh, we need to engage for the improvement of human rights in North Korea. Although the current um, standoff, uh, the US-China standoff is probably not conducive to this kind of efforts, uh, we should uh, nevertheless continue to try. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so now uh, we make conclusion. So yeah, we would like uh, uh, to express our uh, gratitude to today's worldwide audiences and also speakers. Thank you for listening to this human rights session. International society must work together for the cruel uh, human rights situation continually. So without freedom and uh, liberation of the people in North Korea, uh, declaration, the declaration and the uh, financial bonanza cannot be happen. Let's work together. Never give up. Peace on us. Thank you very much.